The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and an overseas shipping agent. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 8. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 8. Good afternoon, Denham Shipping. How can I be of service? Well, I wish to inquire about sending a container of personal items from the UK to Ireland. No problem. Would you like me to give you an estimate of the cost? Yes, please. Well, first of all, may I take your details? Of course. My name's Tim Lafferty. Could you spell your surname for me, please, Tim? Yes, it's Lafferty. L-A-F-F-E-R-T-Y. Thank you, Tim. Now, where would you like us to pick your container up from? My university, if possible. OK. Let me make a note of the address. It's Abbeyfield University. Is that A-B-B-E-Y-F-I-E-L-D? That's right. Park Street, Brighton. Perfect. And may I take down your postcode, too? It's B-R-8-9-P-3. Great. Thank you, Tim. Have you the container's measurements? I do. It's approximately 2.5 metres long by 1.25 metres wide. I see. Quite a big one, then. Indeed. And the height? I make it a metre and 20 centimetres deep. So that's 2.5 by 1.25 by 1.2. Right. And what will actually be in the box, Tim? Oh, mostly old uni books. OK. And some music albums. Anything else? Yes, a little bit of stationery. I see. And could you put an estimate on the value of the items? The books are quite valuable. They're worth around £1,800. The music albums, maybe half that, say £900. And you can put the stationery down as £300. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 9 and 10. Now listen and answer questions 9 and 10. OK. And will you be purchasing contents cover from us also? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Sorry, let me explain. Because your items are worth more than £2,000, we recommend that you purchase insurance to cover yourself in the event of damage or loss. Makes sense. What are my options? Well, we offer three insurance deals. The premium rate, standard rate and economy rate ones. Premium offers full cover in the event of loss, damage or theft, which means you would be provided with the full cost of replacing your belongings. 
What about standard and economy? Standard will give you today's value, the second-hand value of your belongings, and economy provides you with a fixed payment of £1,000 in the event of loss, damage or theft. Well, I can afford to live without those books, to be honest, so just give me the cheapest option. We recommend standard cover for all our customers. No, thank you. That won't be necessary. The cheapest option will be fine. No problem. And one last thing. Will you be needing delivery at your office, at your house, or do you intend to pick up your container at the port? Home delivery would suit me best, I think. We'll get that process for you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a discussion between three people in a university tutorial. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about city traffic and the motor car. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. We're very pleased to welcome Professor Isaac Nebworth to our tutorial group today. And he's come to share one of his pet passions with us. City traffic and our Western dependence on the motor car. I believe questions are quite welcome throughout. Thank you. Well, I know you're all very familiar with the superhighway here in Melbourne. But do superhighways automatically lead to super wealth? as our politicians would have us believe. I think not. Can you give us an example of what you mean exactly? Sure. Well, by continuing to encourage this dependence on the motor car, we simply create more congestion and more urban sprawl. And you can see that here in Melbourne, right under your nose. Excuse me. I would just like to say that I feel the sprawl is part of the city. The freeways mean people can enjoy the benefits of living away from the centre on larger blocks with gardens, but still be able to drive back into the city centre for work or entertainment. Well, I'm not convinced that people want to do that. And is our money being well spent? It may be OK for you now, but come back to me in five years' time. Let's take City Link, for example, the new freeway here in Melbourne. Well... I use the freeway all the time. I think it's great. Ah, yes, but it cost $2 billion to build, and you could have gotten ten times the value by putting the money into public transport. If you give the automobile road space, it will fill that space, and you'll soon find you'll be crawling along your city link. But surely you cannot simply blame the car. Some of the blame must rest with governments and city planners. Well, there is an argument, surely, that building good roads is actually beneficial because most new cars these days are highly efficient. They use far less petrol than in the past and emissions of dangerous gases are low. Old congested roads, on the other hand, encourage traffic to move slowly and it's the stationary cars that cause the pollution and smog, whereas good roads increase traffic speeds and thus the amount of time cars are actually on the roads. Well, this is the old argument put forward by the road lobby, but for me it's clear-cut. Roads equal cars, which equal smog. Public transport is the way to go. In the second part of the discussion, the professor talks about public transport in different cities. 
Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Now, on that topic of public transport, I read somewhere recently that Australia isn't doing too badly in the challenge to increase the use of public transport. Better than America, granted. But by comparison with Canada, it's not so good. For instance, if you compare Toronto with the US metropolis of Detroit, only 160 kilometres away, in Detroit... Only 1% of passenger travel is by public transport, whereas in Toronto it's 24%, which is considerably better than Sydney, which can only boast 16%. Well, I think it's encouraging that our least car-dependent city is actually our largest city. 16% of trips being taken on public transport in Sydney isn't too bad. But it's a long way behind Europe. Take both London and Paris, for instance, where 30% of all trips taken are on public transport. Well, they do both have an excellent underground system. And Frankfurt comes in higher still at 32%. I understand that they've been very successful in Copenhagen at ridding the city of the car. Can you tell us anything about that experiment? Yes, indeed. Copenhagen is a wonderful example of a city that has learned to live without the motor car. Back in the 1960s, they adopted a number of policies designed to draw people back into the city. For instance, they paid musicians and artists to perform in the streets. They also built cycle lanes. And now, 30% of the inhabitants of Copenhagen use a bicycle to go to work. Sydney, by comparison, can only boast 1% of the population cycling to work. It could have something to do with all the hills. Then they banned cars from many parts of the city, and every year 3% of the city parking is removed. And by constantly reducing parking, they've created public spaces and clean air. Really? There are also freely available bicycles, which you can hire for practically nothing. And, of course, they have an excellent public transport system. Well, that's all very well for Copenhagen, but I'd just like to say that some cities are just too large for a decent public transport system to work well, particularly in areas with low population, because if there aren't many people using the service, then they don't schedule enough buses or trains for that route. I accept that there is a vicious circle here, but people do need to support the system. And secondly, the whole process takes so long because usually you have to change. You know, from bus to train, that sort of thing. And that can be quite difficult. Ultimately, it's much easier to jump in your car. And often, it turns out to be cheaper. Sure, but cheaper for whom? You or society? We have to work towards the ideal and not give in all the time because things are too difficult. Anyway, let's move on to some of the results of the survey, which I think you'll agree is... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students, Ramil and Kirsten, discussing presenting a paper at an architecture conference. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 28. Hi, Kirsten. 
Have you heard about that architecture conference in Oxford at the end of the year? Yeah, I saw the leaflet on the notice board. As it's my final year, I ought to try giving a paper, but I've got no idea how to go about it. Oh, I think you should go for it. <sighs> I did one last year. It's quite straightforward. First of all, you need to see what the conference themes are. You know, what topics they are covering. Mm. You can do that by looking it up on the website. You need to submit a paper that falls into one of the categories they give you. Oh, that may give me some ideas. Then, while you're doing that, you should also have a look at the information on how to submit your paper. Mm. The rules, if you like, such as the length. It's important you follow those. I see. And then I suppose the next stage is to start writing it up. Mm -hmm. I'd like to use it as an opportunity to propose some future work, but I understand it must be based on current work. Still, there's plenty to choose from. It makes sense to do something that I'm more familiar with. Yes, and the other thing is, when you've written it up, then go back and look at your data carefully and make certain that you've presented it in a format that is standard for your subject. Uh, Remember, people have to absorb information very quickly while they're listening. Don't make it too complicated. OK, well, I reckon that'll take me about a month to get that sorted. Then the next thing I have to do, I guess, before I send it off to the conference organizer, is give the whole thing to the events officer so that he can look through it and see if it all makes sense and is OK. Yeah. Remember to warn him that it's en route so he can fit it into his schedule. Oh. Then you're done, really. All you have to do after that is to go through it and sort out any changes you need to make. Then finally, you can submit it. You can do that online. Phew. Good. Then I just wait to hear, I suppose. How long does that take? Mm, it depends, but usually about six weeks. Oh. When you hear if your paper has been accepted, then at that stage, it's worth giving them a list of any technical things you need when you actually give the talk. Mm -hmm. A screen or video players or that sort of thing. OK, but that's a long way off. Mm. <laughs> and I know that if my paper is accepted, then at that stage, I have to give them a short text about myself and my academic background so that they can put it in the brochure. <sighs> Famous at last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 29 to 30. Right, well, I've got to get a couple of things sorted if I'm going to get this paper completed. Have you got enough data? Possibly. I'd like to reinforce some of it, though, so I thought I'd send out some more questionnaires. I was looking at that thesis that Angela wrote last year, and she said you need a sample of over a hundred to be sure of your results. I think some of this year's postgraduates are doing some of the same stuff as you on buildings. Why don't you talk to them? Uh, I'll end up getting confused. It would be more useful for me to actually go out to that site by the rail bridge to see how they're building the new factory. Oh. I managed to get hold of Professor Barnett at London University, and he said I should go out and take pictures. I'm pretty busy, but I'll have to make time. Anyway, what about you? What are your... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four.
a second session on interview skills. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello there, everyone, and welcome to our second session on interview skills. Now, we have already looked at what to say in the interview and what to wear. So let's consider non-verbal behaviour, or as it is more often called, body language. Believe it or not, Research has shown that this is what makes the strongest impression on people we meet. Frequent eye contact is one aspect of body language which goes down very well with interviewers and creates a good impression. Looking at people means that you're sure of yourself and confident. In fact, one famous car company even makes a note of the level of eye contact candidates make during their recruitment process for this very reason. So it is very important to maintain eye contact but be careful how you do it. Avoid staring, as this is a sign of hostility. But avoiding eye contact altogether and looking away or down is even worse. But the general message is maintain that eye contact. Believe me, the eyes have it. Now, along with eye contact, smiling is one of the other important non-verbal actions which say more to the interviewer than any answers you give. A good way to create a good impression during the first few minutes of your interview is to smile warmly when you meet the person or people who will be interviewing you. It shows them that you are relaxed. Facial scanning takes a triangular route, from the eyes down to the mouth and back to the eyes. Even when you aren't speaking, an interviewer will be noticing your mouth, so give a relaxed smile whenever you feel it is appropriate. Now, not surprisingly, interviewers pay most attention to a person's face or head during an interview. And they certainly pick up a lot on what they see. Researchers have identified nodding as going down very well with interviewers. This simple gesture shows that you are listening and paying attention. Another useful head gesture is to tilt your head slightly to one side. Now, this reinforces that you are listening well to what the interviewer is saying to you. However, tilting your head back isn't such a good idea, as this signals arrogance. And drooping your head forward indicates that you are lacking in confidence. And as we all know, that is exactly the opposite of what an interviewer wants to see. So the message is, mind your head. Now posture, or the way that you carry yourself, is an important area of body language to be aware of. And it is one of the first body language signals that interviewers read as you enter a room. Posture also matters when you're sitting down. A well-supported position, with your shoulders square and sitting full back on the chair, will give the impression that you are confident, which is just what the interviewer wants to see. I once interviewed a candidate who perched right on the edge of her chair throughout. I kept feeling that she was about to run out of the room in terror. However, occasionally leaning forward slightly when the interviewer is speaking reinforces the message that you are keen and interested, as well as showing the interviewer that you're actually listening to what they are saying. But don't overdo it by leaning too far forward. That can be a bit distracting for the interviewer. Now, we all tend to use our hands to gesture, especially when we are explaining something or as we become involved in what we are saying. This is fine. It shows that we are keen and perhaps even excited about something. However, what can work against someone at an interview is when they fidget. This kind of moving about is, of course, what we do when we are nervous, and fidgeting can be very distracting to watch. So if this is a problem for you when you get nervous, it is a good idea to practice sitting with your hands gently resting in your lap or on the arms of the chair. Try not to fold your arms, though, as this tends to look uncomfortable or hostile. 
but whatever movements you make, be careful with your hands. They need to be kept well away from your mouth, head or face. In fact, experts say that when a hand flies up to or over a person's mouth, it implies that the person is worried or wound up about something. For most of us, staying calm in an interview situation is a challenge, so putting in a bit of practice in advance will help. So, to end with, here are a couple of suggestions on how to improve our body language. A good idea is to choose a role model, such as an actor or fictional character, or a public figure or someone you know. Then sit calmly and imagine that you are this person. Now, other countries have different body language signals. So remember that if you are being interviewed abroad, you may want to check if there are any special gestures to avoid. It's also a good idea to get used to reading body language signals. You can do this by simply watching how people interact in public places, such as on the streets or in restaurants. And finally, when people have struck up a rapport, it is reflected through the natural mirroring of each other's body language movements. So you can use this to your advantage by occasionally mirroring the interviewer's own movements. For example, if they lean over to one side, you can do the same a few seconds later. It helps to create a special effect known as similar to me. But don't do it too often or the interviewer will notice. Now, any questions before we move on to interview listening skills? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.